This video uh, covers chapter four of the book. It uh, is a fairly short chapter with um, a number of topics, rather miscellaneous topics, uh, some of which we are kind of revisiting. So for example, loads, boundary conditions, and also assembly. I'll, I'll cover again, mentioning a few additional comments that I think are necessary and going into these in a little bit more detail. I'll also introduce the topic of contact. This occurs um, in some problems where different bodies will contact each other. I'm explaining it here in the context of uh, mechanical contact, but contact will also occur perhaps in um, thermal problems. And indeed there is a tutorial, tutorial number 11, which does consider both mechanical and thermal contact. And I'll, I'll say a few words on that later on in the presentation. This presentation is, is separated into two parts. First of all, I go through loads, assembly and boundary conditions. And then in the second part, I'll move on to contact. I'm only looking at some fairly simple methods that are used to treat contact algorithm or to treat contact first of all there's gap elements these are used mostly in implicit codes and then i'll move on to the penalty based force method which is used more in explicit finite element analysis and then finally i'll give a bit of a wrap up with some of the tutorials relevant to to these topics and um, also highlight some of the things that are covered in perhaps a little bit more detail in, in chapter four of the book. In the first video concerning chapter one, we did introduce this idea of point loads uh, being used in some very simple examples so that we could obtain a finite element solution of a simple set of equations. These um, point loads were applied at nodes. They lay in the Cartesian frame system so everything was very simple. We could just we could just simply add this load to the to the load vector of the problem. If you're dealing with a multi degree of freedom system, and um, the load is let's say not uh, in the Cartesian frame, it's in an oblique direction, then you would actually have to apply a transformation to these loads so that they lay in the Cartesian frame or the components lay in the Cartesian frame, and these would then be added to the load vector. There are, however, other loads or load types that could be applied, and I've shown these here, given these, these particular terms. This is the one I've just been mentioning. This is um, the load vector for nodal forces. It's point loads at nodes, but it could also be, if you're dealing with shells or beam elements, it, it will also contain uh, moments and there will be degrees of freedom for rotations. In addition to these nodal forces, we could also have surface forces shown here. So these, these surface forces are, if we have, for example, a a shell element with a pressure applied to this shell, a normal pressure loading. This pressure has to be converted into equivalent nodal loads of that element. And these then, these nodal loads would also be added to this load vector. One of the issues here is that the, uh, the normal force in this case uh, if the shell is not, if, if it's inclined to the Cartesian frame, then those normal forces will also be inclined to the Cartesian frame, and you would have to do transformation before adding them to the overall load vector. We could also have body forces shown here. Body forces are, for example, gravity. Um, there is a tutorial number seven where uh, another form of body force is present, and they, those are um, centrifugal forces to a spinning, uh, created due to a spinning disc. In this case, the body force also has to be transformed into uh, 
um, nodal forces before it could be added to this vector. And lastly, we could also have initial strain, strain or initial stress forces. So for example, if we have um, thermal expansion occurring due to temperature change and coefficient of thermal expansion of a material, this will create stresses or strains. And these also have to be converted to nodal forces and added to the uh, global force vector for the for the problem. So this one this one is containing nodal forces and possibly moments if it has uh, bending elements and these are all all nodal forces. Not all of them of course will be present in every problem it depends upon the problem but if they are then they have to be added to this global force vector um, and th this is what will be used in solving the system of equations for the problem. In the next slide, I'll explain these different uh, terms in a little bit more detail. So here, for example, um, a simple case of a 1D element shown in the first diagram. If we have a point load located at a position X, the overall 1D element has a length L. This load will create two reaction forces, which we see here and here. We can determine these reaction forces using this set of equations, where this is the two shape functions for that particular element, and this is the applied load. If you look at this set, uh, um, this system, you see if, if x is zero, then R1 is equal to the applied load P, and R2 would be zero, and vice versa if x is equal to L. And at any intermediate position, you will correctly find a distribution of that force to the two reaction forces. In effect, reversing the reaction forces gives you the equivalent applied, lo applied loads which would act in this direction here. So the system of equations is in fact as shown here for these applied, equivalent applied nodal forces. If we have a distributed load as shown in this diagram, and I made it a little bit more interesting by having Q1 at this end and Q2 at this end for different magnitudes of dis distributed load. The value of the distributed load at any particular point would be given by this equation here. So again, we're using the shape functions, but in this time, in this instance, we're just using it to find a particular value at any particular position x. If we want to now work out these reaction forces, we have to use this expression and integrate it over the complete length x. So that's given by this expression here. And my qx is varying along the length of the beam. If you multiply that out, integrate with respect to x over the length of the 1D element, you'll end up with this, these relationships here. And I think if you, if you say, okay, Q1 is equal to Q2, so that I've got a uniform load equal to Q, say, if you feed it in there, you'll find that uh, the reaction force at one end is LQ over two, and at the other end, it's L, also LQ over two. So in fact, reversing those, um, well, this, this would be the equivalent forces acting in this direction for this particular loading as shown. You can express this as, as this set of equations. This would be the applied loading, and these would be the shape functions for this 1D element. 
if you had a shell or a, um, a 3D solid element and you had, for example, a line load along one of the edges, you would use these equations to work out the forces at the two nodes for that particular edge. So this would be the shape functions for a 1D element in that case. But you can also use this expression for working out the um, for working out the nodal forces for the case where you have a pressure applied to a face of a solid or a pressure applied to a face of a shell element. In that case, this would be my applied pressure and this would be my shape functions for the face of the element. So if it was a four node face, either for a shell or a solid, then this would be the shape functions for a quadrilateral, say. If it was a triangular element, you would use the, um, the shape functions for the face of a triangle element. In that case, it would be just three n shape functions that would appear here. Again, the integration would be done over the surface of the, of the face. Body forces are, as I mentioned previously, gravity or centrifugal forces. This would be density. If it's gravity, it would be density times um, gravity acceleration. And the integration would now be done over the complete volume. These would be the shape functions of the element you're looking at. So it's very similar actually to the previous expression, except um, the Q is replaced, if you like, by this um, alpha, which is for gravity density times acceleration. And these would be the shape functions of the element in order to distribute the body force to equivalent nodal forces. For initial forces due to thermal expansion, you have either this term or this term. They are equivalent. The negative is because if you had a thermal expansion, in other words, something got bigger, you would create, it would be generating internal, the equivalent of internal compressive forces. So that is the expression here for the negative. Um, I won't derive it here, but this B matrix transpose times the internal stresses due to the thermal expansion does give the nodal equivalent nodal forces. And in tutorial five, uh, there is a nice example which considers a bimetallic strap strip which undergoes bending due to different thermal expansion coefficients of the two materials. And the actual method in which this is calculated is explained. It has to be done in two steps. First of all, you have to do a thermal analysis to work out temperature differences. Then from these temperature differences and the coefficient of thermal expansion, you can get the magnitude of these stresses, which are then used to compute these nodal forces which are then used in a second analysis together, possibly with any of these types of um, additional nodal forces that might be imposed. So I hope that gives some idea of the different types of nodal forces that could be computed and could be used in a uh, mechanical analysis. As I mentioned earlier, there are different types of boundary conditions that might be applied in field problems, and I will be dealing with that in, uh, in the next video on chapter five of the book. I'm moving on here to just look at uh, boundary conditions. This is something actually I, meant I, I go through in the first chapter of the book, but I think it, it might be appropriate just to mention it here and to show a few more things concerning boundary conditions and assembly of matrices. If we look at a simple bar element, we apply a 
load p at one end it's free and we have then a force at the other end now for this system to be in equilibrium static equilibrium obviously f1 must be equal to minus the applied load p the system of equations is given here for this particular problem so this is our standard equations for a bar element I'm using K and minus K instead of EA over L in the stiffness matrix here. Multiplying that out, we have these equations. And as I just mentioned, F1 is equal to or minus P. That means that these two equations are identical. That also means that there is no solution in this particular case the stiffness matrix or the yeah the stiffness matrix is pr for this problem is singular the determinants would be zero there is there is no solution so the only way to obtain a solution is to apply a boundary condition either at this end or at this end and then apply the loading to the free end that would allow a solution to be found Mathematically, what's going on is, in effect, is that, that the, the problem has a, um, an in indefinite number of possible solutions due to the fact that it can undergo rigid body deformations or displacements. There is no unique solution. There is an equation um, given here concerning the number of rigid body modes that must be suppressed. So for example, if we if we're looking at, at our one degree of freedom problem here, we have two times one is two minus one gives us one. There is one rigid body mode and that rigid body mode must be suppressed by one boundary condition. I should emphasize here, this is only for implicit problems where we have to invert a stiffness matrix. If we're dealing with an explicit problem where the system of equations is a dynamic problem, then we don't have this problem. We never form a stiffness matrix. We never invert it. You can analyze um, explicit dynamic problems without any boundary conditions. Um, that wouldn't present a problem. It will just, because of the mass effects, it will just undergo some accelerations and you'll get loading from the analysis or stresses and strains in the structure from the analysis. For an implicit problem, we have this difficulty that we have to suppress rigid body deformations or rigid body modes. Using this uh, previous expression, I just mentioned if we have a one degree of freedom problem, we have to have one, we have to suppress the one rigid body mode requiring one constraint in the x direction. If we have a 2D problem, we have in this case, as shown in this diagram, we have two degrees of freedom at each node. So the number of rigid body, body modes in this case is 2 times 2 minus 1, meaning 3. In effect, what we have are a rigid body motion in this direction, a rigid body motion in this direction, and a third rigid body motion, which could be rotation of the complete structure as a rigid body. So we need three boundary conditions to suppress this. The obvious one would be something like this. This node suppressed in the X and Y direction, and this node suppressed perhaps only in the Y direction to stop this rotational rigid body mode. Just to be clear, um, the supports you introduce should represent the same as the physical structure. And obviously the physical structure will have supports, otherwise it will move in some way. These are only the minimum number of constraints. Of course, you can have as many 
constraints added as you want in order to represent the physical problem. But these are the minimum ones we need to ensure that we can invert the stiffness matrix and obtain a solution, in effect stopping the stiffness matrix from being singular. If we have a three-dimensional problem, we will have five rigid body modes. You will have to constrain an X, a Y and a Z direction to suppress these translational rigid body modes. And you will also have to suppress any two of these three rotations. Once any two of them are suppressed, you will in effect uh, be suppressing the third direction. This is just a kind of review of how we, a uh, reminder of how we did uh, apply boundary conditions. It's a very simple problem. Uh, we've got just two bars. We did this already in, in, the, in the chapter one video, actually, but I just wanted to, to repeat it here. We've got the two bars. Um, for example, we could suppress here and here. In order to, it, there's only one degree of freedom, so actually we only need one boundary condition uh, to suppress the rigid body mode. It could have been applied at any one of those three nodes. But for this particular physical problem, I suppressed the two ends. Assembly gave us this set of equations. And for the boundary conditions, we apply a one in the diagonal of the suppressed degrees of freedom and we apply zeros here and here here and here so overwriting any stiffnesses this will then um, force once this matrix is inverted and multiplied by the loads it will force that the two end displacements are zero and you will obtain a value for the the free node displacement. You, once you've got these displacements, you can then apply the strain displacement relationships to get a value for the strain in the element. And then you can use the stress strain law for the material you're using with the stiffness in order to get the, uh, the stress in the element. That's basically the the process we use. And it doesn't matter whether you've got uh, thousands of degrees of freedom or whether or not moments, if moments are constrained, ex exactly the same um, technique is used. You place a one in the diagonal of the constrained degree of freedom and the off axis values are all overwritten with zeros here and here. In the video on chapter one, we did already look at assembly of stiffnesses. In that case, it was a structure similar to one shown there. And to keep things simple, we, we, we considered it as a one degree of freedom problem of the type you would have perhaps in a heat analysis. The discussion was mainly showing the way that the, the matrices are added together. But I also mentioned uh, the need to have a consecutive numbering system for the nodes and the way in which these numbers uh, were modified so that you have the minimum difference in node numbers for each of the elements. This um, would then lead to a so-called banded stiffness matrix as shown here. And that has the advantage that all of the information is stored around the main diagonal. Because of symmetry, only, we only have to store this information. And all of the zeros are here um, and it can be, can be ignored in the, in the matrix inversion algorithm. If you move on and consider a more complicated structure, so let, let's, uh, let's imagine this is a beam, six degree of freedom, beam element, six degree of freedom here, six degrees of freedom here. 
and these are maybe shell elements for all of these so again each each node has six degrees of freedom so for example this one would be three times six it would be an 18 by 18 stiffness matrix here would be a 24 by 24 stiffness matrix in this case um, the the stiffness matrices in the adding process in the summation process for example if we, if we look at this one here each of these cells would become a sub six by six stiffness matrix the whole thing being a 12 by 12. in the displacement vector these would be your displacements for each of the nodes so in this particular case it would be six values here and six values here for each node um, displacements containing of course displacements in the uv and w direction and rotations for the nodes and then similarly in the load vector we would have this information here and here and again the, as the assembly is, is very much the same for each of the elements um, but of course if if they are shell elements then this would be a six by six a six by six and a six by six if boundary conditions are applied for example uh, one moment perhaps at this node is constrained it might be the m m m m2 z for example you would be applying a one in the main diagonal once all this is added together you will be applying a one in the main diagonal which would be somewhere around here and a zero everywhere here and here and a zero somewhere here and somewhere here i'm sorry i haven't drawn that out completely but i hope i hope you follow the uh, the idea of how this is done I haven't in the book or here explained anything on the matrix inversion this inversion process for this stiffness um, things like Gaussian elimination are used for this inversion that only operate as I say on this banded part but there are other techniques used and each of these uh, software codes does usually have a number of different approaches that could be used for the matrix inversion but normally Gaussian elimination is the standard approach I think that's really all I wanted to say on loads uh, boundary conditions and assembly I will move on in the next section to um, to, to say something at least about apply application of contact in um, in treating the contact between different bodies in an analysis In this part I just want to introduce the topic of contact this can occur in a finite element problem if you've got moving parts and two of these parts contact each other usually this contact generates some kind of mechanical forces to resist the contact but contact can also be of interest in other types of problems for example in a, in a heat problem you may have contacting bodies and a transfer of thermal properties between or temperatures between the two parts there are different methods to treat contact and I'm, I'm just going to briefly introduce two of these first of all gap elements which are um, mostly used in implicit codes and just to be clear if you do have contact with an implicit code it is actually a nonlinear problem because the contact as it develops and contact surfaces change it causes the stiffness matrix to change so of course this is now, now a, a nonlinear problem there is another type of um, treatment for contact which is usually used in explicit finite element analysis and this is a penalty force method where you create temporary penalty forces to resist the the contact I'll also at the end of the lecture just give a, a brief wrap up 
um, highlight some, some of the tutorials that involve contact that you might want to try and uh, also um, briefly explain some of, the, some of the things I've rather jumped over in this presentation that are maybe described in more detail in chapter four of the book. First of all, just, just to mention some of the terminology that's used in these uh, contact algorithms. Most finite element codes use this um, system for naming things. Uh, and Calculix also uses this. If we have two bodies, I've shown them on the left there, hitting each other, we have to define potential contact surfaces. So we define a slave surface and a master surface. If, the, if these are shell structures, they will be the shell elements, or they could also be the faces of solid elements, for example. Some of the more advanced codes than Calculix can also treat contact between beam elements, for example. And in some, some codes, not Calculix, but some codes, you could just define this volume. For example, you could, you could just define this. And they have algorithms that will identify the contact automatically. But in, um, in, in Calculix, and other codes, it's necessary to define the potential contact surfaces in advance. And we call this, as I say, one time it's called a slave surface and one time it's called a master surface. I've shown potential contacts here and here, two cases. If this is our slave surface that's moving and our master surface also moving and they, they start to hit each other, this contact is identified here. So this slave node is identified as hitting this master element, for example. There is a, at the point of contact, there is a new node, let's say temporarily introduced, which is called a shadow node. And these two um, are identified as contact and forces are introduced to resist this penetration. This can be done, as I mentioned, with either gap elements or penalty force methods. But let's just say there is a force. So we have a force here applied in one direction and we have forces here applied in the other direction. The methods to create these forces are different, but essentially uh, one thing that will be used is the shape functions will be used of this particular element to distribute this force to these nodal forces. So this will use the techniques I mentioned right at the very start of this presentation. If you had the situation shown here, where this is our slave and this is our master, the algorithm will check for penetration of all slave nodes to master surfaces. This is called a single sided contact. In this particular case, you can imagine things don't work very well because this, this potential contact here will not be identified and contact will only be identified when this node reaches this point or when this node reaches this point. In other words, you'll have a penetration like this. So checking slave nodes on master surfaces can, be, can go wrong in effect. So there is a double-sided contact where the treatment is done twice. First of all, you check all slave nodes on master surfaces and introduce forces to resist this penetration. And then you reverse the role and call this the slave nodes and this the master surface. And the checks will be done again. In that case, this contact will be identified. A shadow node will be in place here or created here and resistant forces will be imposed here, here, and on this one. 
So a very quick introduce, introduction to these uh, definitions of slave and master surfaces. And as I say, these are normally defined in advance, these two surfaces. But uh, in some more advanced codes, you could have single, single definitions where, um, where the algorithm will, algorithm will identify all these potential contacts. I just want here to show some of the main features of these gap elements. They are in explicit finite element codes, but mostly they're used in implicit finite element analysis. You can see a gap element there in the top left diagram. The idea is that you have an element, a kind of spring element. Um, it has a, a certain length. This length would probably, well, it would represent the separation of the two bodies where you're trying to model contact. If these bodies separate, then there would be no contact. But as, as this spring compresses, in the case that you get contact, at some particular point shown here at a distance delta, then we assume contact takes place and from zero stiffness we now introduce a, a stiffness. If, um, if you look at a implementation of such an element in a, in a small structure. We've, we've got the structure drawn here. Um, this could be a 2D problem, but it could also be a 3D problem. So you could imagine these being shell elements here, or the faces of solid elements. This would be one node on one side, and here could be another node on another side. And this would be our gap element. As I mentioned, um, you, you, well, you can place these gap elements between nodes, but as I mentioned on the last slide, the gap element could be somewhere, um, and, and from projection, you can work out a shadow node where it contacts, and then you could distribute loads or forces at that shadow node to the attached nodes of the element, either a 1D element or a 2D element of face. This would be possible. So both approaches would be possible. I'm just keeping it simple here and looking at a gap element implemented between two nodes. This gap element will be orientated in some direction, most likely. It will not lie in the uh, Cartesian frame system. So we have a direction n and a tangent direction orthogonal to this in a direction t. The spring system is, is shown here. We've got our normal spring, but we also have a tangential spring introduced in order to give this some stiffness in this direction. the normal spring Kn, the tangential spring Kt. We've got normal forces shown here for the node I, local forces, and we've got local forces for node J shown here. And these would also have displacements. This then is our local system of equations. The, um, again, the force vector and the displacement vector are shown here. And this is our spring stiffness denoted here for this particular system. So if these two bodies move, we'll have in this region some displacement denoting contact. And if we multiply these displacements by the inverse of the stiffness matrix, we will get resistance forces, which are local forces. They will have to be transformed into the global frame before they can be added as contributions to the global stiffness matrix of the complete structure. 
sorry, before these forces can be added to the global force vector of the complete structure. You can um, also have friction effects for this contact in this direction, Coulomb friction, for example. And in the book, I do explain very briefly how that is done. You end up with introducing some small modifications to this stiffness matrix where you have Coulomb friction coefficient and um, the normal force causing some modifications to the tangent stiffness in this direction. Just to mention regarding this diagram, in this region we can't really have completely zero stiffness. We have to use a very small number in order to make sure that these diagonals are not zero. That would, that would cause a singularity to this stiffness matrix. So we use a very small number. Typically 10 to the minus 13 would be okay. In this region, we're using a stiffness which is really intended to stop penetration of these two bodies. So the typical numbers you would use for spring stiffness here, this, this Kn, which is equal to Ea over L, the Young's modulus E would be the average of the stiffness of this surface and this surface. If both are still, for example, you'd introduce Young's modulus for still. But if you're having a contact between a very soft model uh, material and a very hard material, it can be advisable to take an average of those two stiffnesses so that, so that the flexibility of the soft material is partly taken into account. So that would be getting the E value. Area would be typical value of this area or this area that that node, each of these nodes represents. So you just take an average sort of area there. And the length would be the contact distance between these two nodes. So that would give you Ea over L. If these are shell elements, the length would be typically this half shell thickness plus this half shell thickness added together. If they are faces of solid elements, the value is really zero, but you have to use something. So a typical value might be two or three millimeters. Again, the idea is really to come up with a stiffness which is intended to stop penetration of these two contacting bodies. This penalty-based method penalty force method is really a technique that's mostly used in explicit finite element analysis, problems such as car crash, metal stamping and so on, or just in short duration impact problems. Essentially, uh, the techniques are rather similar. You define master and slave segments. Also in these codes, you can define single surface contacts that can be very popular. So for example, if you're, if you're analyzing car crash and you have a collapsing main rail, this is a box section at the front of the car that can collapse and fold up. There is no way you can really define which surfaces are going to contact which surfaces in this folding process. So we tend to use single surface, um, sorry, we tend to use self contact options, which allow you to for example, define the whole volume and the algorithm will look for the contacts as, as, the, as the impact or crash event is, um, is occurring. But what I'm just trying to show in the top diagram there is, is two surfaces that have penetrated each other. You will have springs set up. So for example, um, this slave node let me try to just show you this slave node will be projected onto this master surface or better said there will be a position found here and the normal projection comes to this slave node and this then would be one penalty spring 
As I mentioned at the beginning, we often swap the roles of the slave and master. So for example, in a, in a second uh, loop, this may be a slave node and the projection of this master onto this slave node gives us this particular spring. The same sort of thing is done for these two nodes. And essentially we have these temporary springs set up. I've denoted them as springs, um, but in fact what, what's created here are forces. And these resistance forces are given by the formula here. Alpha is a, para a parameter that the user can choose. Typical values are 0.1 to 0.01. E is the modulus of the materials, and it's usually an average of the modulus of this particular surface and this particular surface. Area is the contact area. So for example, Let's see, this, this, this particular slave node represents a certain area given here, or a certain area on a face or a shell element. And that would be the area that would be computed and used here. And distance is the distance of penetration, so it would be this particular distance. So this is a rather important point that these algorithms only work when you actually have penetration taking place. And the idea in a penalty of these penalty methods is you create a, a contact force. It is applied, of course, in this, this node would be pushed in this direction. And this shadow node would be pushed in that direction in order to move these two bodies backwards. And the idea in this um, in these explicit algorithms is to choose a fairly or to obtain a fairly small force value which will be applied over many cycles, perhaps several hundred cycles this will be applied and gradually um, this force which is applied as an additional external force to compute accelerations of these nodes. Ex eventually these accelerations will be modified so that the, the two parts start to separate again. The idea is not to generate a massive force and to push the parts back within one time step iteration. That would cause numerical problems. The, um, there is an example on this. I use a, a rather simple beam example in tutorial 11. It's an explicit analysis, um, not using a finite element code, but using free mat. We program the behavior of this beam and we introduce a contact point so that when this oscillating beam hits this particular plate, uh, which this location is 30 millimeters, so we can see it here as it as it hits this plate. Um, in, instead of doing a sort of behavior like this, it hits the plate and then is rebounded, hits the plate again and rebounds. And again, just to emphasize the idea is to introduce a fairly soft contact force that causes the um, the structure to rebound over a number of cycles. So although you don't really see it here in this region there will be penetration it will go further than 30 millimeters and maybe we have 50 or 60 cycles just as a number in which um, forces are built up and then gradually the beam is rebounded here are three examples or three problems relevant to some of the the things I've been discussing in this particular presentation. In tutorial six, there is this um, uh, thermoelastic problem of a bimetallic strip. A thermal, a thermal analysis is undertaken to work out temperatures that are applied and temperature distribution throughout the bimetallic strip. And then from these temperatures and the different coefficient of thermal expansion for the two materials,
you can work out stresses that are created. And these stresses are then imposed as additional nodal forces for a standard mechanical analysis. So this is one example um, regarding the, the sorts of loads that can be applied uh, within a, a finite element analysis. I covered this at the very beginning of the presentation. There is the explicit analysis of a beam using InFreeMAT, which I have just mentioned. That is in tutorial 11. And also in tutorial 11, 11 is a implicit nonlinear finite element analysis, a contact problem involving two rings and a rubber seal. It's quite a quite an interesting problem. It, it, is, it is a bit of a challenge for Calculix. And in fact, uh, Calculex, although it does manage the solution, is not really suited for these kinds of severe contact problems. Um, other codes would, 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 commercial codes would manage this, I think, much better. But it does involve contact. It, it will show you how contact analysis is undertaken. And it also includes this, um, this issue of uh, heat transfer in contacting bodies. Um, which is, a, which is an interesting further aspect of this particular problem. I think I've covered most things uh, in chapter four reasonably in this presentation. Perhaps two points that I've rather neglected are um, friction treatment for gap elements. And I also give in the book a bit, bit more of a discussion on contact algorithms used in explicit codes for problems like impact, crash, metal stamping, and so on. In the next presentation, I move on to field analysis. So if you are interested in problems like heat transfer, fluid flow through a porous media, electrostatics or magnetostatics, then I, I, will, I hope that maybe you'll find the next presentation of some, some interest.